The nation's top-ranked college basketball team returns to action on Saturday when Kansas visits Kansas State. Star beat writers Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell break down the 293rd Sunflower Showdown, the rivalry contest that ended in a brawl the last time the teams met. This is Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Friday, February 28th. After a break, Jesse and Gary tackle some other topics, including the idea of KU not being the top seed in the Midwest region in the NCAA tournament. Oh, short of losing a few games down the stretch, which is unlikely, KU will be a top seed, but don't lock them into the Midwest region just yet. Jesse explains why. We also talk about the Jayhawks' top candidates for postseason honors. They've got a few. So here's Jesse and Gary talking Kansas basketball. Jesse and Gary are here, and I imagine there have been times in the history of the Sunflower Showdown where Kansas and Kansas State met as a first place and a last place team, but it probably hasn't happened in a long time. I wouldn't think. Kansas State just hadn't finished last, and Kansas is um, always Kansas. So it, it makes this game just a little unusual for Kansas to go to Manhattan and be such an overwhelming favorite. I haven't seen a line yet. Have you seen a line yet, Jesse? No, it should be 12 or 13, somewhere in that range. That's what you're thinking. But um, Sam Mellinger and I talked yesterday on yesterday's podcast about Bruce Weber and uh, and, and what this season has been for the Wildcats. But um, <laughs> uh, it, it one thing you can say this for K State, they're gonna they're gonna have a pretty good idea about who the nation's best team is after this week, uh, having played Baylor in Kansas, in uh, in, a, in a span of a few days. What does um, uh, Gary? What, what do we um, uh, what do we think about KU and the way that they came off the Baylor win and played against Oklahoma State on Monday night? Um, I, I was I actually I actually was pretty impressed with that. Yeah, they've won 13 in a row now, I think it is, uh, 12 or 13. 13. But um, they're playing pretty pretty good basketball right now. And uh, since that Baylor game that they lost, they just seem to be getting better. So this game, the game in Lawrence without those scrap at the end of the game was such a one-sided game. It was almost like the only story of the night was going to be Christian Brown hitting five threes or whatever he did. He just kind of dominated the game. But it was kind of blah. And this game in Manhattan, with them being last, like you said, and KU first, there. and if KU comes and plays its regular defensive game, you would just think they would control the whole thing like they did in Lawrence. But I guess the only thing we're going to learn is if the rivalry does matter <laughs> is the fact that it's a rivalry 90 minutes away going to keep the game close because like you asked how are they playing I think pretty well that game at Baylor uh, was pretty impressive except for how they almost you know blew it at the end could have could have, could have closed it out a little better yeah. but, but uh, they led for what 35 minutes in that in that Baylor game look Kansas State has beaten uh, KU a couple of times and Bruce Weber has some victories over over KU in in Manhattan I don't expect Saturday to be one of those, Jesse, but uh, um, it, it's almost like, I don't know, maybe the Wildcats' last chance to make a good impression on the season, and I, they, I don't think anybody in the world would expect them to win, but maybe they could just draw a line in the sand that they're not this horrible a team. Yeah, it's it's tough because I, I think you're right. I'm trying to think back to when one was first place, one was last place. I was thinking back to the Big 8 tournaments. I remember KU and K-State played as a 1-8 game one time. And so it, it has been a while. I don't think these teams have been separated like this in, in quite some time. But you also have the underlying fact that these two teams brawled last time. And K-State fans, they get one chance, or K-State students especially, get one chance to have KU's basketball team come to their place. And they are going to be loud. They are going to bring signs. They are going to be ready. They are going to scream things in the pregame that KU, KU's players have not heard all year. And so maybe, like, like you said, Blair, if, if there's ever a moment for K-State to come together as a team, to be united, to um, play well, it would seem to be that this would be the time to do that. However, I, I almost, you know, it's, it's kind of a dangerous thing, too, because you could see the opposite happening, which is what if KU gets up? <laughs> 20 to 4. I mean, 
is it just going to empty out at halftime? Do those fans just not stick around? So, yeah, it's a it's a difficult thing to try to predict here because I, I could definitely see some of these emotional things coming together here in K-State because of that playing well. And I also could see that really just being a sort of a pregame thing before, hey, uh, KU comes out here and, uh, and and dominates an opponent and K-State is kind of left with uh, students standing there like, ah, don't want to be around here anymore. Gary mentioned it. Um, I remember the first game. I was here for the first game in, in Lawrence and Christian Brown had, had the really good game and, and I think we all kind of agreed that that was the story of the game uh, in the you know, um, 39 minutes and 59 seconds of of play at 20 points. I don't think he's topped that since, has he? He's I don't think 20, so. 20 has been his best, and uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe that'll be a, a, a story going into this game as it was Christian Brown's, the, the anonymous great game by <laughs> Christian Brown. But um, uh, what, what, listen, the way Kansas has been playing lately, what, how, do you, how do you see this thing unfolding? What, what does Kansas State have to do? What does any opponent really have to do to have any kind of success against Kansas? Probably hit hit some threes and hope KU doesn't hit them because usually KU doesn't hit them, but they've had a couple games of late. They've made nine or ten. But uh, aside from that, I guess if Doak's on kind of a roll, he's had two monster games in a row, maybe keep him to reasonable numbers, try the double-triple team and hope KU Brown and uh, Moss can't hit from outside and Ochai – just has, you know, his normal 10-point, 12-point game and uh, let Dotson get his 22. Bill addressed it today. I, we, we're, we're recording this on Thursday, by the way. Um, transparency. We like to offer the transparency. <laughs> uh, that Doak has been so good at, at passing out of the double and triple teams and finding the open guy and maybe Kansas is shooting a little bit better because of it, because of some of these threes are open looks and – I don't know what Doak's assist rate is these days, but maybe uh, maybe better than you'd expect the seven footers to be. But um, it is what else is Kansas doing particularly well these days, Jesse? Well, I mean, they're just a, a good team with how they're constructed. You know, they have four guards on the perimeter that are all switchable. Um, you know, they've got guys uh, that can sort of force everything to the outside, kind of like Baylor does, kind of like Texas Tech does. They force things away from the middle, and then because they do that, they force guys right into Yudoka Azubuki, who's a great rim protector and has shown himself to be great on the boards and also a guy that can avoid fouls while he's doing that. So you have that on the defensive end, and now it seems like in the last few games, Bill Self and staff have really figured out how to utilize Yudoka Azubuki even when there are double teams from other teams because they've kept the ball in the middle of the floor. It's really hard to have help defense when everything's in the middle and Doke is full head of steam going straight toward the rim. I mean, you have to pull out one of the guys from the corners to help, and that's just a really long distance to do it. And if you do, then you're leaving somebody wide open in the corner. And for now, you know, Christian Brown's hitting threes and Isaiah Moss is hitting threes. So um, it's a difficult thing to try to guard. I would say the biggest hope for K-State and the one strength that they have and the one thing that kind of plays up at Bramlage Coliseum is – defensively they get after you they overplay the passing lanes you know they're physical they might not get all those fouls called on them but you know they've been so bad offensively lately but you know some of that can be fixed is you get a steal you go in transition and you hit a layup with nobody guarding you and so again if we're talking about KU being so great in the half court well, the one way to score against that is to get a steal and go to the other end. And KU's been so good at getting the ball to Doak and, and making things miserable for opponents. Well, if you don't let them get in their offense to begin with, potentially you can hold them down offensively by just stealing the ball before they can really run anything. So I think that for K-State is kind of the biggest hope is that Bruce Weber kind of has one of those defensive performances from his teams where they're motivated, they get out, they get away with a little bit of pushing and shoving because they're at home and they play real physical and that KU doesn't match up with that physicality. And We've seen in moments this year that KU has turned it over. I mean, they turned over 28 times against Duke in the season opener. It's a long time since that moment, but uh, at least the potential is there if K-State really heats things up that you could solve some of KU's offensive issues and you also could solve some of their defensive issues by doing one thing that the Wildcats actually do pretty well. And then if that happens, the crowd will get into it a little bit. Exactly. I expect, I, I really do expect a full house at Bramwich on, on Saturday and the fans if they have been staying away and I don't blame them if they have for the way the season has unfolded for the Wildcats they'll come to this game they absolutely will use their tickets for for KU the other thing I I, I think about with Kansas State is they you know yes we, we spent a lot of time talking this year about how much they miss Barry Brown and Dean Wade and 
Kamau Stokes, but they, they've also have some. They've got some returning veterans who uh, who haven't had the kind of seasons that they've wanted to have. Uh, Xavier Sneed and Cartier Jada, McCall Maywean, all of whom have had decent games against KU in in previous years. So, look, maybe it's just one last opportunity to uh, for them to to make a statement or to. Um, you know, bust out and have have a good game against the the best opponent left on their schedule. So, all right, let's take a break. And when we come back, there's there are a couple other issues I want to talk to Jesse and Gary about. We'll be back right after this. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners: unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer and as always, thanks for listening. Back with Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell talking KU basketball. The Jayhawks play at Kansas State, Bramlage Coliseum, on Saturday, 12.30. Interesting tip time. 12.30 tip. I don't. I guess I'd, CBS must have some other programming on that day that affects the, the tip time. Um, uh, so, yeah, on, on CBS. Hey, um, Jesse, I thought you not only asked a great question to Bill Self today, but he gave you a terrific answer on uh, NCAA tournament seeding. Not so much seeding, but site selection. We know that the four regional sites, this isn't the first and second round, but the Sweet 16 and the regional final sites are in the west, Los Angeles, in the east, New York, in the south, Houston, and in the midwest, Indianapolis. We... um, Kansas right now, if the season were to end today, would be the overall number one seed. And if this were any other year in college basketball, as we were uh, projecting the tournament, and if you look at any mock draft right now, you would see Kansas as the number one seed in the Midwest. But it may not be so easy. Um, that's it's a reflex action to put the the team in its natural region in that in, in the Midwest and in, in uh, where where, uh, where it was where it is closer to that school. But that's not necessarily going to be the case or doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, it's fascinating. So if we go back in history, I think the most um, – the biggest example of this was back in 2016. KU was the number one overall seed, and they went to Louisville, which was a few miles closer than Chicago. So but both of the Louisville and Chicago were regional final seeds, uh, destinations. Exactly. The Sensible Tournament Committee sent KU to Louisville. It was a few miles closer, you know, if you look at that Google was, Maps or whatever. That the was the be. letter of the law. You had to take the team that was the cl- closest. You put the team the closest to the, the the site. And Chicago is one of the top three places that KU has alumni. So for Kansas, they would have preferred, as the number one overall seed, to play in Chicago. However, because of the law of the land or exactly the rules that were in place at the time, they were sent to Louisville. And, you know, KU lost to a very good Villanova team that year. So I don't think that this anybody is, the yeah, that, that anybody's blaming this on, oh, my gosh, this is the region, the reason for it. But I know that, you know, people at KU were upset thinking, hey, if they're the number one overall seed, they should be able to choose whether, you know, if it's one that's a matter of a few miles. Well, since then, the NCAA has made it so that the number one overall seed gets to choose its sites. And nobody else does, but that number one overall seed is rewarded by that. So um, I did ask Bill today just because it's interesting for Kansas that Indianapolis is closest, and it's pretty easily the closest from distance. But Houston would have some advantages as well because, for one, it's sort of Big 12 country. And then for two, um, it, you know, one of the things that could pop into everybody's head is that Indianapolis is being played in the football stadium. Houston is being played in a basketball arena, which... Which surprised me. I guess I didn't realize it until this came up today, that they're not playing at NRG Stadium. They're playing in the Toyota Center, which yeah. is where the Rockets play. So it could be another thing, but um, I think Bill Self, when he answered the question, brought up something I wasn't thinking about, which is very true, though, which is um, we tend to think of these things like, which is closest to Kansas? But if you think about all the two seeds out there, where are they going to be closer to? Houston or Indianapolis, and the fact of the matter is almost all of them are closer. You know, you could, you could drop a lot of teams that are very close to Indianapolis that would play Kansas, and Kansas would not have sort of a 
home court advantage or have more of the home fans, you can't drop many, very many when you talk about Houston because Baylor is going to be a number one seed along with Kansas. And outside of that, okay, so if you play, you know, Dayton in Houston, okay, well, I mean, Dayton travels well, but Kansas and, and Dayton are both going to travel about the same amount of fans. You're not going to have a disadvantage. But, yeah, you look at those teams up there, maybe a Creighton, maybe, um, you know, uh, some of the other ones he was mentioning, or not, not that he was mentioning, but that we were popping off in our heads, you know, Dayton, uh, you know, even even schools in the Midwest like Kentucky could be close to um, in Indianapolis. So uh, for Kansas, it's sort of an intriguing scenario. And again, they have to follow through. They have to to win some games down the stretch and see how they compare to other teams out there to get the number one overall seed. But I don't think that this is a cut and dry thing. I think this is something that actually is going to take some discussion from them to figure out which is the best place for them. I think that they would have the most fans in Indianapolis because it's close to Chicago, which is a big base, but I don't think they'd have too many more because Dallas is a big base too, and that's a nice drive all right down 45 to make it to Houston as well. So um, sort of fascinating in kind of the the behind-the-scenes work that KU's going to have to do to figure out which of these sites is going to be best for them. I find it interesting that in the 2016 example, um, Kansas uh, might have griped because it inconvenienced fans because, it, like you said, it's a connection, connected flight to, to get to Louisville from anywhere in Kansas, Kansas City, City right? Yeah. Um, this way, if they chose, if they decided to select Houston, it's a farther distance, certainly from Lawrence and Kansas City, that would inconvenience fans and fewer seats because Indianapolis is in the uh, the, the dome at uh, Lucas Oil, the dome, the stadium now it used to be a dome, now it's a Lucas Oil field. So fewer fewer fans would be able to go, and they'd have to go farther from this area. To Houston than they would Indianapolis, but as you mentioned, and as Bill said, there might be some competitive reasons to make that call. It's fascinating. It's one of those behind-the-scenes things that I know a lot of fans have talked about and asked about, like, well, are they just going to go to Indy or not? But it really is their choice this time, and I think with that, they are going to have to take a little bit of time, time to decide. And it sounds like Bill has thought about it already, just because, um, yeah, this is it's important. I'm not saying it's you know it's a huge impact. I'm not going to affect you ten points or something, but a point or two, and potentially you know getting a team in a true neutral instead of having them be in their backyard, that sort of thing. It definitely could play a factor in what happens that here down the stretch. Hey Gary, um, this time of year, especially when a team is is going well as Kansas is, we talk about honors, postseason honors, and um, who who might be um, you know who, who might be favored for that, and that came up in Bill Self's press conference today. It just occurs to me that you've got you've got three players who are pretty strong first team all conference uh, candidates in Ezebuki, Devon Dotson and uh, Marcus Garrett. But I also think because of Kansas's position as the top ranked team, um, there are some people around the country that are looking maybe for some guidance from people who cover Kansas um, to kind of lead him into the idea of who would be the best player for Kansas for an All-America slot, you know, yeah. first-team All-America, or even a National Player of the Year consideration. The, the old, you know, there, there's all kinds of arguments to be made. Doak is the player that nobody else has, but a team doesn't operate unless, you know, like it does unless Devon Dotson is as effective as he is, and Marcus Garrett may be the Defensive Player of the Year in the country. What, what, are, yeah. your thought, what are your thoughts on some of this? Well, I think Dotson would be the guy that would get the National Player of the Year if anybody does. First of all, Doak's free throws are still so bad (laughs) that how would you have a National Player of the Year who's one of the country's worst in one category? But Dotson... Even even though he's leading the nation in field goal percentage. Yeah. Right? Those aren't from 15 feet, Blair. (laughs) None of them are. Dotson's stats are really good. uh, And... I think Jesse was saying that Ken Palm has – isn't he the runaway national player of the year? Yeah, as of right now. Some of and, again, stats? that's one measurement, and that takes in a lot of factors like how good your team is. And it's basically statistically. So, I mean, it's sort of – it can't go in-depth into a little bit more of the nuance, which maybe big men are more valuable defensively than, than guards are, that sort of thing. But uh, as of right now, yeah, he's kind of the runaway favorite for national player of the year. It doesn't usually follow the Ken Palm Award, but uh, the numbers out there, just with what you're saying, Gary, that Devon's been efficient. He's taken on the biggest role for Kansas. He scores in the most difficult situations because yeah. he doesn't have anybody pass him the ball. He just goes, takes the ball, and scores. And then his free throws, which he's gotten the line a bunch and scored a bunch from there, um, that's very helpful for an offense as well. You also add in the fact that he leads KU in steals, last time I checked. Uh, you know, we talk yeah, about Marcus Garrett a lot, right. but, I mean, that's a very 
good thing for a team to have is for your best offensive player or one of your best offensive players to uh, to contribute that way defensively. So a lot of the numbers are going to point to Devon. I think um, a lot of the national people that don't get to watch Kansas every day are definitely going to point to him just because he's leading the Big 12 in scoring, and a lot of the numbers are really nice. I think yeah. there's a lot of influence by Fran Fraschilla and TV people who, you know, if Doak has a big game, it's you hear, you know, Fran make a, make a case for him. And I, I think that – um, that may influence some some folks as well. I thought it was interesting. One thing Bill Self, I heard Bill Self say is, and that is, he didn't think Devon Dotson could be this good of a of, a, of an offensive player to average to lead the league in scoring. Yeah. When, was he at eighteen or something? Yeah. So you know, Bill Bill was saying that he's you know, Devon's even better than he thought uh, he could be. Yeah, yeah. And I wrote about this earlier this year. I think kind of get into his brain and sort of what I talked about as well like you go into this season thinking how can Devon Dotson get better and there's just two obvious things where he could get better which is his three-point shooting which was bad last year and then his ability in pick and rolls to see the floor and deliver lobs and be a better passer I mean if we're being frank he hasn't gotten much better at either one of those you know what I'm saying like Devon Dotson is sort of the same player in that regard and Bill Self lauds or talks all about in practice how he's a better shooter but just hasn't come in the games yet and uh, again, for Udoka, he Udoka doesn't get many assists from Devon Dotson. He gets them mostly from Marcus Garrett and right. other players out there. So for Devon to be this productive, he basically, instead of sharpening his weaknesses, he just strengthened his strengths, which, again, right-hand drive, get to the rim, score way better. And we, he was really good last year. Or get to the free throw line, get fouled a bunch, make free throws. Way better than he was a year ago. So it's, it's sort of amazing because you just didn't see much margin for him to get better at what he was already good at. And yet... You know, Devon Dotson's taking that from a 90 to a 99 while keeping some of his weaknesses, you know, like a 30, and then it's gone to like a 32 or something. So I think that's probably what Bill Self was talking about, and I agree with that statement, which is basically that I saw Devon Dotson getting better in certain other areas this year, and instead what he's done, he's just said, nope, these are my strengths. I've gotten better at those, and because of that, now I'm probably the runaway, well, not runaway candidate, but definitely a candidate for Big 12 Player of the Year and potentially all all. All American, you know, first team All American. Yeah, I was thinking about All American because you've got to come up with five guys, and it's not you're not looking at the usual sources like uh, the ACC necessarily. Mm-hmm. We talk about this season as being a, you know, a mid major type of year, and you look at the top ten, just how many are there. Um, look, uh, and the great players on, on a lot of these teams, but they're not the kind you see on necessarily on Super Tuesday or Big Monday or the the ESPN games during the week uh, on a regular basis. How often have we seen San Diego State play this year or Gonzaga or, you know, Dayton? Just not 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 as often as we see Kentucky Duke, North Carolina even. So, yeah, let's riff, Blair. I mean, who are five right now? I mean, I'm thinking Luca Garza, Iowa. He'll be Big 10 player of the year. Obi Toppin from Dayton. From Dayton. Uh, you pick a Jayhawk, I would probably say Devon Dotson, Dotson uh, Powell maybe. from uh, Seton Hall. Powell from Seton Hall. And then a fifth one, I mean, I'm Vernon Carey at Duke, maybe. maybe. I mean, I don't know. Uh, is Nawara, has he had the numbers from Louisville? Yeah, Potentially. Yeah. He's, I, he's probably going to be, I don't know who ACC player of the year is going to be. What about Marcus Howard? And, Mark, and he's leading the nation in scoring. Exactly. Marcus Howard Marquette leading, leading the nation at 27 points a game. It still seems like somewhere in there you can squeeze a Jayhawk, especially with them being number one the type of season they've had. And I kind of go back to what Gary said. I think that if you're from the outside looking in, the easiest thing to look at is points per game and production. And I listen, I've, I told you last week, Blair, I think Devon Dotson's the best player on this team and has contributed the most for them. Um, you know, Obviously, Udoka is amazing, and Marcus Garrett has had his amazing moments, so I don't disagree with that. Uh, that particular thought either, but I, I just think that the easiest path is going to be the one when it comes to these voting. And this voting, and I, I just think that Devon is probably going to take a lot of those. Something to keep in mind: um, a lot of these kind of ballots close. Uh, the voting closes at the end of the regular season, even before conference tournaments, mm-hmm. and uh, so a lot of decisions will be made on this topic in the next week and a half or so. So, all right, Gary Bedore, Jesse Newell, thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. That'll do it for today and this week on Sports Beat KC, the Stars Daily Sports Podcast. Thanks to the production crew of Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett, along with today's guests, Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore. It's a busy weekend in Kansas City sports with college basketball bearing down on the postseason, Chiefs personnel scouting draft prospects at the NFL Combine, The Royals continuing spring training and Sporting Kansas City opening their season Saturday night at Vancouver. There'll be plenty to talk about next week on Sports BKC, where we talk sports in Kansas City every day.